It's the middle of a dark, foggy October night at sea. You're on board a warship, part of a great fleet of over fifty vessels, but the fog is so thick you might as well be alone. Slowly, you begin to notice movement in the darkness. You make out the hazy silhouettes of small boats approaching. You've been warned the enemy is nearby, planning to ambush you. This must be it. You raise the alarm. Signals are sent to the rest of the fleet, and suddenly the dark night is lit up by gunfire and explosions coming from all directions. Little do you know, you've made a terrible mistake. This is just the first mistake on history's most disastrous voyage. Hello and welcome to episode two of History's Most. My name is Peter. And I'm Alex, and today we're taking a look at history's most disastrous voyage. Yep. It's going to be about the Russian Baltic Fleet's voyage to the Battle of Tsushima in the Russo-Japanese War. And this is a this is a pretty good story. There's a lot of interesting events that happen here, not to mention how kind of important the the conflict itself is but this this story just on its own is absolutely amazing isn't it i know if you were to imagine um going on a naval expedition going sailing around the world what possibly could go wrong i think pretty much everything you could think of <laughs> is going to go wrong in this story yeah murphy's law <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a big example of that. I mean, weather, uh, dangerous wildlife, enemy ships, disease, food, logistics, fuel. It's all going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of issues that plague this this voyage. Um, so for a little little context... Let's um, let's talk about the Russo-Japanese War just for a little bit. So, the Russo-Japanese War was a conflict in 1904 to 1905, which uh, basically was fought over kind of just clashing ambitions of, of power in uh, the Far East, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, both sides saw themselves as kind of having a right to be the dominant power in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. um, and both Russia and Japan had kind of been increasingly at loggerheads about who was going to be the naval power yeah. of the Far East, um, with Russia gaining, in the years before the Russo-Japanese War, uh, Port Arthur, which mm. is in modern-day China, and the Japanese really seeing that as a threat to their kind of control of the North Pacific because this port, uh, unlike Vladivostok, mm. uh, a bit closer to the Arctic Circle, uh, Vladivostok is frozen over for a large chunk of the year. So it's not particularly useful if you're a naval power. Mm. Whereas Port Arthur was something that gave the Russians access to the Pacific all year round. Yeah, so you'll want to... That's an obvious, like, you definitely want that, as opposed to something that you can only mobilize half the year... Exactly, and the Japanese um, increasingly, obviously into the 20th century, have kind of imperial ambitions. Mm. They'd fought a war against the Chinese at the end of the 19th century. They already had control over Korea, and they felt threatened by the fact the Russians had taken, uh, had seized Port Arthur. They were building a railway line to connect it to the trans a Trans-Siberian Railway, which would cut across Manchuria in China, which later Japan would claim for itself. Mm. And so, Port Arthur, this is really where the Russo-Japanese War kind of begins, as the Japanese launch a, essentially a surprise attack 
on Port Arthur to try and take this for themselves. Yeah, the Russians have something called the Pacific Squadron Mm -hmm. based at Port Arthur, which is obviously the big threat to the Japanese fleet. And they launch a surprise nighttime torpedo attack, um, which kind of has mixed results. Mm -hmm. And the Russian fleet out in the Pacific is is obviously outnumbered by the Japanese, Mm -hmm. but engages in a few um, kind of minor and major battles with the Japanese some of which kind of it's kind of overall the Japanese come out on top but it's it's not decisive one way or the other sea mines and torpedoes are kind of fairly new weapons at this stage mm. and they can do quite frightening things to warships um, so both sides are quite wary but it's clear to the Russians that uh, they're going to have to send more ships out to the Pacific yeah and this is where the Baltic fleet comes in so obviously the main Russian naval strength is at uh, St. Petersburg, hmm. the capital city at that time, and a port on the Baltic Sea. Obviously, the Baltic is much more where Russian kind of naval power is focused. You know, quite naturally, it's hmm. uh, their kind of home port. And they've got um, more ships there. They've also got a brand new line of uh, the Borodino class Warship, the newest warships on the planet at that time, newest battleships, mm. I should say, um, which are all built between and finished between 1903 and 1904. So these are, you know, brand new yeah. battleships that they want to uh, get out to fight the Japanese. Mm. Japanese, on the other hand, at this time, don't actually have the facilities, the industry to build uh, battleships. Right. You know, the big, um, the biggest class of warship, mm. the heavy hitters. And their battleships are being are built in in Britain, in the UK. Right. Um, and Japan has an alliance and quite a close friendship with the United Kingdom. Their officers, uh, naval officers, basically use the Royal Navy as as their model. Yeah. And a number of them are kind of trained in Britain. Yeah, the Japanese they really uh, the Japanese officers they really did model themselves after British. Uh, admirals and naval tactics, and the Russians, obviously, they 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 have, you know, they're not the most seafaring nation in the world. No, they're not. You know, Japan, like Britain, is an island, nation, mm-hmm. a big island, but yeah. an island nation all the same. So it's full of uh, people and communities who live and work with the sea. Hmm. Russia obviously has, <laughs> obviously has thousands and thousands of miles of coastline yeah, the, but it's very much a land power um, the Baltic and the North Pacific mm-hmm. obviously like we said often uh, you know with five of us sort of frozen in the winter so nowhere near the seafaring kind of tradition mm-hmm. and that inexperience is going to play a big role in um, yeah, what is be... to come <laughs> It's going to be significant when they are about to attempt the, I believe, the longest voyage uh, by a navy for a naval fleet ever. Yes. Attempted, um, just 18,000 miles. <laughs> just a little trip to the store, back again. <laughs> I mean, the scale of this is, is one of the most fascinating parts of this most disastrous voyage, is for a nation that you know has not traditionally put great battle fleets to sea to attempt to conduct during wartime like i said the longest naval voyage ever mm. it's it's extraordinary yeah and they they make it there in the end but <laughs> it's the getting there yeah <laughs> it's it's it's, it's the getting there so uh the Baltic fleet they they leave Saint Petersburg. When do they when do they leave Saint Petersburg? Yeah, so it's um, they were supposed to leave it in June nineteen oh four, but things get off to a bad start. It's a real like logistical nightmare, right? Because this is a huge fleet. Um, they call it the Second Pacific Squadron because mm. the 
they sort of say the, the ships already out there are the first Pacific Squadron, it's going to be the second Pacific Squadron. But it's about in total with um, four battleships of the new Borodino class I was just talking about, hmm. three slightly older battleships, plus a huge range of lighter ships like cruisers, destroyers, supply ships. A total, it's an armada of, of more than around, I think around about 50 vessels. So you need um, food, you need clothing for Arctic and tropical conditions, you mm -hmm. need ammunition, um, and all of that you need for 12,000 crew members. I mean, imagine trying to feed, just feed 12,000 people for yeah. months. The amount of food you're going to need, mm -hmm. never mind everything else. And um, the guy put in charge of organizing this effort is a guy called Vice Admiral Zinovi Rozesvensky. Right. I'm probably going to mispronounce a number of Russian names <laughs> in this episode, but please forgive me. Um, now, straight away, before they even leave, this is a bad choice. Um, he is uh, Admiral, kind of by fluke. Oh, um, boy. At age 50 in 1902 so only a couple of years before he was only a captain mm. um, he was a gunnery officer and in 1902 the Kaiser the German Kaiser visited Russia and the Baltic fleet put on a display of gunnery right. for weeks leading up to this big show Rozesvensky had been absolutely mercilessly drilling his crew that they are going to, you know, get this right for the Tsar mm. and the Kaiser. We need to impress them. Exactly. And the Kaiser was reportedly blown away, uh, metaphorically, of course, <laughs> literally, <laughs> by the Baltic <laughs> Fleet's gunnery. Um, and the Tsar was absolutely delighted. Nicholas II, um, obviously the Tsar, who's going to be the last Tsar, mm. overthrown by the Bolsheviks, sorry, by the Russian Revolution, and then murdered by the Bolsheviks. Mm. Hasn't got a reputation as a particularly competent man. Mm -hmm. And really, based on just this incident, uh, Rosa Svensky becomes one of his favourites and <laughs> very, very rapidly rises up through the ranks. Mm -hmm. He was nicknamed the Mad Dog <laughs> um, because he was reportedly extremely um, kind of basically short tempered. Yeah, very ordinary. Not exactly the best man to be in a ship for 18,000 miles with. Um, <laughs> yeah, imagine being stuck on a ship with this man <laughs> for 18,000 miles. <laughs> so he has one of the new Borodino class battleships, the Tsvarov, as mm. his flagship. These ships are brand new. As I said, they've not really had time to test them, conduct sea trials. Yeah. The crews are freshly recruited. So they've got no experience whatsoever. Some of them have even the sea. Never mind man of this ship. <laughs> I'm immediately seeing some issues. Um, like I said, you know, Russia isn't a seafaring nation. Mm -hmm. They don't have big pools of, of merchant seamen and, and fishermen and people like that to recruit into the Navy. So these are conscripts. Yeah. Some of whom, you know, might you know, think about Russia as a country, look at it on the map. Some of them might never have seen the sea before. Mm -hmm. Um so it probably won't surprise you to learn they don't leave on time. Yeah, of course. They basically can't leave until the 9th of October, aimed Ooh. for June. Yeah. Because of all the logistical problems getting together this fleet and all the supplies you need. Um, there's a. I, I want to quote you here a speech right. from the captain of one of the battleships, the Alexander III. And I don't know. I think this really puts you into the into the mindset of this fleet setting off. It's very, very ambitious voyage. Okay. He said, "We know why we are going to sea. We also know that Russia is not a sea power, and that the public funds spent on ship construction have been wasted. You wish us victory, but there will be no victory." But we will know how to die, and we shall never surrender. Wow. 
<laughs> wow. So you, so he's putting he's really putting the the carriage before the horse there, um, but he's not wrong. He to be fair to him, he's not wrong. But it's incredible words from a captain on yeah. a brand spanking new battleship mm-hmm. about to conduct the greatest naval voyage in history in yeah. terms of distance. To say that um, to your to your crew. Um, <laughs> well, well, the, the, the mor- you, you already have a morale problem starting there um, before you've even left port. So, yeah. mm. as you can kind of probably get the sense from what we've said so far, this is going to have the tone really of a tragic comedy. <laughs> uh, this is the classic example of tragedy plus time equals comedy, um, because we aren't probably going to help ourselves sometimes, even though, you know, this would be a horrible thing to be involved in. Um, This story is just too good. (laughs) Now, they set off on the 9th of October, 1904, Mm. and the crucial problem is the thing that's the biggest headache for Ross Zimbensky is not uh, food, it's not, you know, the route, it's fuel. Yeah. These ships are powered by coal, um, which is kind of easy to forget, I think. Yeah. A hundred years ago or more, um, diesel was kind of brought in as the ship fuel around the time of the First World War, but we're still a little way away from that. So coal is obviously a heavy, dirty fuel. Mm. Very difficult to refuel at sea. Exactly. And... There is no Russian bases en route. Oh, boy. There is no... Well, there isn't. I mean, you think about geography. They leave the Baltic. There is no Russian port between (laughs) St. Petersburg and Japan. (laughs) Um, So there's nowhere where they can stop to recall. So before they leave, they sign a contract um, with a a German company. Mm. Um who are going to, throughout the journey, send out colliers, coal ships, to meet them at various ports along the route and to recoal. All right. And, well, that's going to be one of the big problems. So in order to get to the first stop, the ships are critically overloaded with fuel, with, with coal. <laughs> they stack up as much as they can. Um, and that only leads to the ships being more... Uh, you know, unbalanced, difficult to handle. Yeah. And straight away on the first day when they sail from 9th of October, one of the battleships, the Orel, runs aground. <sighs> it has to be towed out. And a few days later, um, Ross and Bensky's own ship, the Savorov, also runs aground. Wow. They're not even out of the Baltic yet, and they're already, <laughs> it seems to be going wrong. I. Wow. <laughs> you, you you can't make this up. You can't. It's it's uh, it's an impossible kind of conundrum that they're faced with. Mm-hmm. You can't get there with the fuel that you can carry, so you carry more fuel. But that yeah. means your ships are going to go slower. They're going to be harder to handle. It's the definition of catch twenty two. I mean, it. On the one hand, you kind of feel sorry for them because they don't really have a choice yeah. here. but on the other hand you just think should they not have kind of you can't kind of give up in a war like that but was this a good idea mm-hmm. okay so they are well underway we are a few weeks into the voyage they're leaving the Baltic Sea entering the North Sea mm. heading for the English Channel but there has been, since departure, a bit of a paranoia mm. going around the fleet, not least from Rosasvensky himself, because the Japanese have managed to successfully, through basically fake uh, rumours they're spreading, convince the Russians that Japanese torpedo boats are lurking somewhere 
in the North Sea ready to attack right. the Russian fleet. All right, let's think about that for a second. <laughs> yes, now, do think about it. Now, obviously, it's, it's not impossible for ships to go 18,000 miles around the entire world, as we're going to find out. But how likely is it that the Japanese are going to send torpedo boats to the North yeah, Sea? These are Jesus, boats. Are, they're boats. They're not even ships. Yeah, they're, they're boats. small little boats <laughs> carrying torpedoes. I mean, there was a lot of paranoia about them at this time mm -hmm. in kind of navies around the world because when the torpedo was invented, it was like, whoa, this yeah, changes kind of the rules. Yeah, this is a wake-up call. Warfare. So it would be quite scary, a massive battleship. It's taken years to build, crewed by nearly a thousand. Could it be brought down by just a tiny little boat? Um, carrying a few torpedoes hmm. so that was quite a scary thing at the time but like you say how would they have got there yeah. what port would they be operating from maybe they thought that because England had a uh, ally alliance with Japan that they would have had something there I, I don't know I can't, I can't understand the rationale well, this leads to a terrible, um, a terrible kind of accident yeah. uh, happening on the night of the twenty first, twenty second of October, nineteen o four. They're obviously sailing through the night through the North Sea, um, through an area of the North Sea called Dogger Bank, and the there's a supply ship, I believe, called the. Kamchatka right. it's like a logistics supply and repair ship um, and they spot in the night some small vessels right. it's dark there's fog um, and I believe the Kamchatka is, is possibly lost and suddenly they radio, we're being attacked. We're being attacked by eight <laughs> torpedo boats. They're coming at us from all directions. <laughs> mayday, mayday. Yeah, exactly. What does the Russian fleet do? It absolutely panics. Yeah. So they open fire. Um, now it's pitch black. They, yeah, <laughs> it's totally pitch black. It's like... That I'm I'm assuming that like some of these ships don't even know where to fire. They get the order. Okay, we're being attacked. What do we do? Where do we All shoot? Directions. Uh, just just directions. just shoot anywhere. So you could. I mean, let's put ourselves in their shoes. Yeah. You are sleeping. You're awoken by alarms going off. People are shouting, "We're under attack! We're under mm -hmm. attack!" Torpedo boats closing in. Everyone's running to their stations, manning the guns, whatever. You see a shape moving in the darkness. You open fire. Yeah. And the night is suddenly filled with shells, high explosive, um, searchlights. The battleship Orel, which I've already mentioned, has already run aground. On its own, fires 500 shells that night. Right. So you can imagine the volume of fire coming from this fleet of almost 50 ships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one of the cruisers, one of the Russian cruisers, is hit in a friendly fire, um, <laughs> obviously, because they're just firing, they look into yeah. the shapes. Fortunately, no major damage is done, but a chaplain on board uh, loses his hand and later dies of blood poisoning, which is the first and only Russian casualty of this incident. Right. You said that they saw shapes. They They saw these little boats. Now... Let let me let me just go out on a limb here and and think, they weren't Japanese torpedo boats, were they? No, surprisingly enough, mm. all logic dictated uh, that indeed they were not Japanese torpedo boats. These were fishing trawlers, um, fishing trawlers out from uh, Hull, British trawlers, and many of them were hit. Mm. You had quite a substantial number of casualties, you know, these civilian fishermen killed or wounded by this volume of fire. Britain, obviously, is not very happy about it. Yeah. Especially 
as it takes place, this incident on Trafalgar Day, the anniversary Oof. of Britain's greatest naval victory, the Battle of Trafalgar. Yeah. The British home fleet, uh, at that time the greatest kind of naval fleet in the world, is mobilised and 28 battleships <sighs> arrive to shadow the, uh, the Russians yeah. all the way to Africa. And amazingly... Rossesvensky and his crews are unaware of what they have done um, until they reach their first stop, uh, Vigo in northwest Spain. Mm. Um, they are totally unaware of what's happened. They th- genuinely think they were attacked by Japanese torpedo boats and they managed to fight them off. Wow! Until when they stop, a British journalist comes on board about this incident because back in Britain. This has obviously been an absolute scandal. Yeah. Uh, well, you can imagine it today, can't you? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the British were actually considering like going to war against yeah, the Russians was, as a result of this. This is a big it's deal. Really serious. Really serious. Um, now the Russian, the uh, British decide not to go to war. The Russians agree sixty-five thousand pounds of compensation to the families of the dead and the injured which I mean at that time would have been an insane amount of yeah. um, but what it does mean is this fleet are kind of persona non grata they're not welcome in really any international ports Yeah. and particularly Rossesvensky feels he can't take his big battle fleet through the British controlled Suez Canal Mm. which would have made his journey a lot quicker and easier because oh, yeah. he would have just sailed through the Mediterranean been through into the Indian Ocean instead he's going to have to sail around the Cape of Good Hope uh, I literally circumnavigate the entire continent yeah which almost doubles their uh, their their length yeah so um, this is when the problem of coal and fuel is going to become the war. Yeah. Tricky. Um, now, when they get to Vigo, uh, they're not really welcomed mm. because of what's just <laughs> happened. Um, like I said, this is going to have a really bad impact on neutral powers and how they're going to feel about the Russian fleet arriving. Um, but they've already gone 1,800 miles. So they really, really, really need to recall. Hmm. Um, eventually, the authorities at Vigo say, okay, you can come in, but you're only allowed to load about 400 tons of coal per ship. To put that in a bit of context, um, the battleships consume about three tons of coal per hour. Oh, cruising, boy. And 15 tons per hour if they were sailing at battle speed. Right. So that's not much. No. Um, not going to last that long. So earlier you mentioned uh, that they they made an alliance with a or, or a deal with a German uh, coal company, right? How does that play in in future for this? Are they going to avoid similar incidents or? Uh... Well, basically, this company it's called the Hamburg America Line hmm. has agreed we are going to provide you coal throughout your journey. Their ships. Colliers are going to meet them at various ports. Right. The Germans were kind of sympathetic to the Russians mm. um, because the British were sympathetic to the Japanese. Yeah. Um, so they kind of were hoping that they would succeed, but also probably more interested in making a bit of a profit. Mm. Um, but the next part of the the voyage is really going to be a story of coal right. um, and the kind of struggles around that and the extremes that both the company and the fleet are going to go to to try and keep this fleet moving okay um, so they leave Spain mm. Rossesvensky decides to send his older slower ships along the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal anyway mm. it's probably a little bit of a strange decision because if he's worried about the British uh, to that extent that he's prepared to send his older ships through the Suez Canal 
you know, it makes you think, well, why didn't you just take his whole fleet through there? Um, because they, they do end up going through the Suez Canal. Right. Um, he basically thinks that those older ships won't be able to make the journey around Africa. But it then begs the question, why do this journey around Africa at all? Um, yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why? It, wh- what's I the... guess he thought that the British wouldn't stand for the whole Russian fleet going through, but I uh, mean... Did he ask? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Anyway, next stop is uh, Morocco, the port of Tangier. Mm. Um, so, yeah, once again, it's drama of recalling. Um, and this time, when recalling is due to take place, there's a tropical storm oh boy. blowing. Um, there's 12 military bands on the decks of various ships playing throughout, trying to encourage them. Because I kind of I haven't really put this into context, but the recalling was a you know, a really strenuous task. Mm-hmm. He had hundreds, well, thousands of tons of coal, which has to be shoveled for the most part into kind of cranes, lifted into the next ship, shoveled down into coal bunkers. It's a really, like, strenuous task on the crews. Mm. And obviously, you know, thousands of tons of coal, it's filthy, there's dust. So it's not exactly the conditions you want to do it in. Rosesvensky offers 1,500 rubles to the crew that can load the most in the shortest time. <laughs> there you go. So they're just working flat out. Yeah. Uh, they keep going. Their next stop um, is Dakar in French West Africa. Yeah. And this time it's even worse. Oh. Um, there's 30,000 tons waiting for them from these uh, German ships. But it's, uh, this is really like tropical conditions. It's 49 degrees Celsius heat. So that's 120 Fahrenheit. Yeah. And remember, these, these are, these are, yeah. these are Russians. These are, these are like, and a lot of them, like you said earlier, are just new people who may not have even seen the sea before. If they haven't seen the sea before, imagine how they're going to feel in 120 degree Fahrenheit weather. They will, they <laughs> I can't even begin to imagine it. So imagine that you are on this ship. It's that hot. Yeah. You've got this task facing you of, of 30,000 tons of coal. Mm. It's also 90% humidity. Oh. Um, oh, that hurts. And the French are obviously by this time friends with Britain. Yeah. So are not particularly keen on the Russian fleet staying for very long. So they give um, the French authorities there say you've got twenty nine hours stop. So twenty nine hours to move thirty thousand tons of so more than a thousand tons an hour. Yeah, has to be moved. Um, this is punishing, punishing work mm-hmm. as these sailors slave away. Um, you know. With thousands of tons of coal being having to shovel it, um, men literally die of exhaustion. People die in the heat. People die from the hard work. Um, and Borisovsky has heard that the next French port down the coast is not going to welcome them. Oh, not going to let boy. them in. Yeah. So he orders his battleships which have a capacity of 1,100 tons of coal to take on board 2,200. Right, so he's going to overload them. That's not he's a good idea. going to take on board double the coal that they can um, kind of carry. And the captains of the ships are kind of scratching their heads. This is ridiculous. Where are we going to literally keep it? Mm. Um, you know, because these ships would have designated coal bunkers yeah. Beside the engines. <laughs> Are they just going to leave it on the deck? or? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, I'm quoting here um, from Alistair Horn uh, as a count. He said that uh, draconian instructions were issued. The excess coal should be stored 
in any spare place on the upper deck, lower deck, gun deck, poop deck, and in the cockpit, over closed watertight manhole covers, in the bathrooms, drying rooms, loose on the quarter deck with some means of preventing it falling overboard. Officers' cabins, um, you know, mess decks, gangways, wherever there is space, we are going to pile up coal. Right. I mean... <laughs> Think about it. I mean... 20... I mean, yeah. I mean... It... Oh man! So they're they're just they're desperate. So they're they're putting it everywhere. I mean, first of all, Im- just imagine like the soot. Imagine the, the <laughs> imagine the the men loading this stuff on the deck, and then imagine the deck just being completely caked black. Like, oh I mean, man! For the you know, for us in the twenty first century, isn't something we kind of come across every day. Anymore. Yeah. Um, but everything it touches goes black, it's dust, yeah. the soot goes everywhere so for the next four months these sailors are going to be living in dirt oh yeah they are going to have coal dust in every conceivable crevice in every part of the ship, in their food in their lungs in their lungs and one of the things that's important in a ship obviously is is cleanliness oh obviously. yeah, yeah. not just for kind of disease but for morale, you know, you're stuck on a ship. There's nowhere to go. You know, it's quite important for the morale of the crew that it isn't just filthy. Yeah. So this is this is really this is a bit of a nightmare, mm. um, and you can't imagine many navies in the world just putting up with filth. You know, the phrase mm. "ship shape" <laughs> comes to mind. Um. Yeah. So, it, it's a real kind of nightmare, but it's it's brought about by necessity. Mm. They need the coal. I, yeah. So, well, so I, I'm just I'm just struggling to imagine this. So, so uh, do they do this with every every ship, or is it just this one battleship? Um, I'm not sure whether it's every ship. They have six battleships in the fleet, and I believe these six battleships have to do it. Right. Uh, both because they could carry the most coal and because they use the most. Um, but judging on kind of the problems that they had with fuel, I would expect pretty much every ship in the fleet is overburdened. Yeah. If not just stacking it up on the decks. It's a mad thought, isn't it? Can you just imagine yeah. a ship sailing along in the open seas just with just stacks of coal? <laughs> piles of coal. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you mentioned earlier when they were leaving um, the, the, the Baltics that they were already slightly overloaded. And they this made them incredibly you know, difficult to control. I assume that that already, you know, that what's happening now is <laughs> a similar thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So they get sailing again. Mm. Um, we're still going around the coast of Africa. The next stop, because of the reluctance of the French to house them, to kind of welcome them, is a place called Whalefish Bay uh, mm. in Namibia. At that time, it was a Portuguese colony. Right. Um, now, what you might know about Portugal is that it is the oldest ally of Great Britain. Mm. Uh, it's been in a kind of non-stop, unbroken alliance or friendly, at least friendly terms with Britain since the medieval times. Mm. Uh, but anyway, besides the point, the port there was not adequate for uh, the coaling of this massive fleet. So on the 11th of December 1904, so we've been at sea about three months, mm. um, sorry, two months, they're going to have to carry out recoaling on the open seas. Oh boy. So they're out there off the coast of Namibia in rolling seas and these German collier ships are going to have to pull up alongside and unload their coal. And it's it's total chaos. The um, Suvorov, mm. that's the flagship of the fleet, they're um, the kind of, if you imagine these are, these are pre-dreadnought battleships, they're covered in guns coming out of every conceivable kind of orifice <laughs> um, 
designed basically to deal with things like torpedo boats. Um, as the kind of ships are banging up against each other in the open sea, uh, the guns from Savorov hole the collier, they puncture the hole. Oh, <laughs> the boy. collier that pulls up alongside it. I I was worried that it was going to damage the uh, the barrels, but it, it's even worse. Well, I think it probably did damage yeah, yeah. the barrels as well. <laughs> Um, so Rostovsky realizes this isn't going to work and even worse he orders that the coal needs to be transferred by the ship's launchers i.e. the, like, the little lifeboats yeah. how, so, how is that going to work? have to launch these little wooden lifeboats with oars sail over to the colliers fill them up with coal row back to the to the Russian ships be hoisted back on board and then unload the coal from them I mean it's the most inefficient the most back breaking kind of task you can imagine and in the open sea as well not just sat in a nice calm harbour yeah I, I like how long okay so how long did this did this process take they worked night and day and they only managed to load a few hundred tons, as you can imagine. Yeah. You can only get a small amount in each. <laughs> the lifeboat, you then sail it back, get it out. It was incredibly slow and inefficient. And the mad dog, Rosadvensky, absolutely flew into a rage. You know, uh-huh. he was furious. Um, apparently, a, a young lieutenant on one of the other Russian battleships, the Oriel, or the Orel, sorry, um, lost his mind, it says in Alistair Horne's book, and ran around the deck sobbing, the Japs are waiting for us, we shall all be sunk, we shall all be sunk. Oh, boy. So, um, <laughs> we're seeing a little similar thing here to the Darker Bank incident, where uh, this, I'm assuming this guy is uh, going to cause a little bit of panic. Exactly. The, the tensions, I mean, they've been at sea two months, which is a long time, Mm. They've covered thousands of miles. They've got, you know, every few, um, you know, every few days they've got this back break in work in, it seems, ever harder conditions. And it's taken its toll on the crews. Um, eventually, they manage to, um, basically, the sea dies down a bit and they manage to recall in a slightly more efficient um, manner yeah efficient method um, on the 15th of December um, and a German aboard the ships tells or is it Svetsky that um, 203 meter hill has been taken now this means absolutely nothing to the Russian admiral oh. um, but the German tells him that this is the key height that dominates Port Arthur Basically, the Japanese army is closing on the port from the land direction. Right. So the the Russian Pacific Squadron out there is clearly in dire straits. So it's kind of making Rosyzvetsky's task all the more difficult. So he says, right, we've got to keep going. We've got to get there. Um, there's yet more rumors, of course, that uh, the Japanese are waiting for them. And apparently, uh, off the coast of Durban in South Africa... They were there were rumours that there were civilian schooners like little uh, mm. ships, which were actually Japanese boats in disguise. <laughs> um, so, Rosyzvensky declares that he will ruthlessly destroy all Durban fishing craft that come within range. Okay, that's not a smart idea. <laughs> um, but I mean, the one positive as they set off around the Cape of Good Hope. Is that the worst recalling uh, kind of incident of mm. the voyage is over? So okay. we'll breathe slightly there. We've got through the worst of the recalling stories. Uh, that's that's good at least. So they're they're passing by South Africa now. Yeah, they're are they they're entering the Indian Ocean. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're pretty much at the halfway point, um, but. <laughs> Nerves, as you can sort of tell, are frayed. And um, the Kamchatka, the repair ship that 
initiated the Dogger Bank incident, gets into some more trouble as they round the Cape of Good Hope. First of all, they announced that they had on board basically bad coal and they wanted permission to throw 150 tonnes overboard. <laughs> right. Um, Rosisvensky, the mad dog, replies, find the guilty ones and throw them overboard instead. <laughs> okay. A short while later, the Kamchatka signals a follow-up. Um, it says, do you see the torpedo boats? And of course, the fleet panics. Everyone's woken up, called to their station. And the next message from the uh, Kamchatka is, sorry. (laughs) Basically, the signal explains that uh, when he said, do you see the torpedo? He used the wrong signal. And he meant to say, we are all right now. (laughs) Well, how do you mess that up? I what, don't know. What, what happened? I don't know. Like it's the it's complete opposites. Like <laughs> Oh boy. This just gets better and better. So, just in time for Christmas, they uh they reach the island of Madagascar, which Merry they Christmas. are able to dock at. Um and they fleet as a Miserable Christmas in the port of Hellville. <laughs> I'm not making that up. That is the name of the port they stayed in. Talking about the bad winter. moments. Hellville. Uh, the weather was apparently awful over Christmas. Mm. Um, they received news while they're there that Port Arthur has fallen. Oh, the Russian boy. battleships still in the port were basically destroyed by ground artillery shelling them. Uh, from miles away Uh, so it seems that um, everything's going wrong Um, they also receive news which you might think would be more positive which is the Tsar has dispatched a third Pacific Squadron Mm. so there's the first Pacific Squadron in Port Arthur although that no longer exists or says Vensky's got his second Pacific Squadron um, and by the way, the old ships he'd sent through uh, Suez kind of meet up with them eventually at Madagascar. But news comes from Russia. The Tsar has de- the third Pacific Squadron right. under a guy called uh, Rear Admiral Nebogatov. However, this squadron is made up of the oldest and slowest ships in the Russian Navy that uh, Rosetvensky had deliberately left at home. Oh, He'd left them at home because he thought, these are useless. They are not going to help me. They're just going to be a burden. But the Tsar hears the news that the you know Port Arthur's fallen. He thinks mm. we need more ships. So these are dispatched. And the order is to wait at Madagascar for their arrival, which obviously is going to be some months. So are they going to take the same route that the second Pacific Fleet had just taken? Luckily, the sec- the third Pacific Squadron, the squadron. goes for the Suez route. Um, right. But at this point, upon hearing this news, uh, Rosedvensky uh, requests from the Tsar that he be relieved of this. <laughs> because this is such, he sees as a totally ridiculous move that is going to just cause you know chaos. And he obviously probably didn't want to particularly wait at Hellville for the next three or four months. Yeah. Um... Because the fleet was in really poor shape, um, the ships were at this point regularly breaking, covered thousands and thousands of miles. Um, you've obviously lost men of sunstroke and exhaustion during recoiling exercises. Uh-huh. Um, a disease such as dysentery is breaking out among the fleet. Um, the ships are dirty and stinking. Caked in coal dust, I, I assume. Still, um, they're in tropical waters, and they've been sailing that. So, the the keels, the undersides of the ship, covered in barnacles and yeah. seaweeds, growing on them. Um, it it just doesn't look like a fleet that is um, seaworthy. A, a supply ship arrives from Russia, you know, to obviously 
excitement and things. Um, they were expecting it would be carrying ammunition um, because they didn't really have enough ammunition for many live fire exercises mm -hmm. because of the you know the lack of space. Um, it arrives and uh, it's full of fur-lined winter coats and there's twelve thousand pairs of heavy boots. <sighs> But they're they're in tropical waters in Madagascar. It's totally useless. What what kind of miscommunication creates that situation? I mean, you can you can imagine. I mean, you can't imagine. So. <laughs> <laughs> I I just don't. I mean, like, when was the supply ship sent out? <laughs> Goodness knows. Oh man! And you can you can imagine as well what it's like in hell. You've yeah. got 12,000 Russian sailors. This is their first time ashore since leaving Russia. Probably for the vast, vast majority, it's their first time outside the country. So, drinking, mm -hmm. gambling, prostitution, Hellville would be a vision of hell in itself. Yeah. So, what happens now? They've made it to Madagascar. They're 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 nearly there, right? Like, I mean, I mean, not really, but you know, <laughs> they're they're marginally close to the main one. Yeah, they're a little bit over halfway. Where do they go from here? Is it a, just a straight shot across the Indian Ocean? Well, they're supposed to be waiting for this slow third Pacific squadron um, of uh, these old ships. Some of them are like coastal defense ships. Mm -hmm. um, they're not supposed to sail on the sea. <laughs> right. Um, they were labelled um, in Russian the self sinkers. <laughs> we maybe would translate it as like rust buckets. Um, so they're supposed to be waiting for them. So Rosvensky is obviously at a very low ebb. He tries to carry out like a firing exercise mm. because obviously a lot of the crew are very inexperienced and the ax. The exercise is a, is a total disaster. Um, ships nearly collide into each other. One of the ship's firing systems jams because they find a cobra's nest inside it. Um, basically, a lot of the crew, when they're you know off on shore, um, have obviously months of pay to spend, and yeah. a lot of them end up buying tropical animals. <laughs> um, also, you know, the supplies of food they're getting, again, you know, it even happens to this day, sometimes when you get food kind of transported, yeah. there'll be some exotic creature makes its way into it mm -hmm. and turns up in a supermarket. Um, but <laughs> during the firing exercise, unsurprisingly, uh, Rosovensky is totally enraged mm -hmm. because they, um, the entire fleet fails to score a single hit on a set of stationary targets that were supposed to represent torpedo boats. Um, wow. And obviously they're stationary. <laughs> yeah, torpedo boats yeah, are gonna be real, are gonna be moving target. quite quickly in reality, yeah. and they can't hit a stationary target. So um, so another thing that goes wrong at Howville is that uh, news slowly filters through to Russian crews an event called Bloody Sunday. Mm. This happened on the 22nd of January 1905. It's basically a massacre of protesters um, by the Russian army. Hundreds killed, thousands arrested. A series of like revolutionary disturbances in the big cities of Russia. Right. And obviously a lot of these sailors are worried about you know, their friends and family. And it also inspires mutiny to break out um, on a number of the ships. A total of 14 mutineers are executed, a number of others are dispatched home. Our favourite uh, ship of the fleet, the Kamchatka, mm -hmm. accidentally fires a shell uh, during these disturbances into a cruiser. <laughs> I... And Rosesvensky at this point is now only seen for a few hours a day. He's um, basically under an incredible amount of stress. Um, and apparently, at this point, he was dragging his left leg when he walked. Wow. So it's thought that, uh, well, it's suggested at least, that perhaps he might have suffered a, like a minor stroke. Yeah. 
due to the stress at this time. Wouldn't surprise me. Um, I'm I'm kind of surprised that that mutiny is only broken out now. Um, <laughs> yeah. I I really would have expected it kind of happening earlier, just from I mean, the sheer amount of time and I mean <laughs> just everything going wrong before this. It, you can. It's hard to imagine what it was like being a, particularly, you know, the Russian Navy was not particularly nice to serve in. Mm. Officers were not particularly kind to the men. It's filthy. It's this massive voyage. You know, the news that's coming through from both home and from the war is bad. Mm. Everything that you think can go wrong is going wrong. You know, these people weren't stupid. I'm sure they could see the ships were not really, uh, you know, in any sh- shape to fight a battle. Yeah. There was periods of... Um, kind of people going mad, people getting drunk, people either like falling off ship or committing suicide. Mm. Uh, there was kind of religious mania that swept the fleet for a while. Um, so this is really a, a hellish experience. Yeah. I well, hell in hellville. Um <laughs> So uh, where do they they go from here? So they're, they're, they've moved on from from Madagascar. Is it are they just going across the Indian Ocean? How straightforward is it until Japan from here? They head across the Indian Ocean. Um, apparently, they do not see another ship as they cross the Indian Ocean, which wow. is quite remarkable. Um, at one point, the supply ship, one of the, the supply ships that's carrying food, mm. um, their refrigeration units break down. Oh, boy. And about 700 tons of bad meat has to be thrown overboard. Now, you can imagine what this is going to do in the Indian Ocean. 700 tons of meat. Yeah. Swarms and swarms of shark oh. disappear and, and follow the fleet for miles. And they make it absolutely impossible for this. There's teams, like underwater teams, who are trying to clean off the weeds and the barnacles. Wow. From the undersides of the ships. That is such a perfect storm. I <laughs> can you imagine. Wow. So basically, that task, which is really important, has to be totally abandoned. Um, and all these barnacles and weeds that is slowing the fleet down to, it's, it's estimated. They're using up about 100 to 130 tons of more of coal daily. Right. Just because of this, uh, the level of kind of... Fouling that's, that's yeah, on fouling, there. Yes. Yeah. Um, but remarkably, they managed to cross the 3,500 miles of the Indian Ocean without further real incident. Mm. Um, the colliers are now sailing with the fleet. And um, they just stop every few days to recall, to take the coal from the colliers right. into the ships, but then just keep going so they don't need a port. Uh, the food situation isn't great. Mm. And uh, Nebogatov's self sinkers don't know where Rosadvensky is. <laughs> He's not told uh, the Russian authorities. Um, so the fleet is kind of off the radar. For, for a little while. Right. They just disappear without anyone knowing? Yeah, and they are not seen again um, until... Uh, so, the the third Pacific Squadron, the, the self-sinkers, when they pass through the Suez Canal into the Indian Ocean, they telegraph back home to Russia and ask for instructions. Right. The reply is, and I quote, you are to join up with Rosetvensky, whose route is unknown to us. <laughs> right. Okay. So they cross, the self-sinkers cross the Indian Ocean themselves. Um, they reach Singapore and they hear that um, the main fleet has already passed Singapore on the 8th of April. Mm. Uh, now, uh, this is a report from Reuters um, as the fleet pass Singapore. Mm. 
and I think it's just an incredible image to imagine. It says in a quote, The smoke they made was visible for miles. The ships, magnificent but foul, were proceeding at about eight knots, and it took them 55 minutes to pass a given point. All the vessels showed signs of their long voyage in tropical seas, about a foot of seaweed being visible along the way, and the decks were laden with coal. So, I mean... Wow. You, you yeah. can only kind of... What an image. You know, this gigantic fleet. Mm -hmm. 50 ships that are just filthy, that you can see the weeds growing off them. It's just kind of looking like... You can see the coal stacked up on them. Yeah, like massive swamp thing. You, you know, like... I, Oh, man. That must be a sight to see. And, I mean, especially because they're, they're in more, you know, kind of populated areas now. They're passing Singapore, and they're in... Mm -hmm. or they made it across the Indian Ocean. Imagine being somebody in port and seeing these ships roll through. Ima like, Im well, first of all, I imagine the embarrassment that Rosovensky must be feeling right now. For... Yeah, I mean, he is a sailor. Yeah. Um, and I don't think he was ignorant of the fact that um, this is embarrassing. This is pretty humiliating yeah. for Russia. The state of this fleet and the way it's reported around the world. Um... But but even more worryingly, he's now in country. He's in the Pacific, mm. and the fleet is now you know in a state of alert because they they know the Japanese could attack them at, at any time. Yeah, now they actually have a reason to be worried about uh, about Japanese yeah. ships. Exactly, and they also know that they are being spotted. Mm. Their location will now be known. Um, this is before obviously radio radar spotter planes are, are really none of those things are, are very common uh, in the navies of the world at the time mm. um, so a fleet could kind of go about undetected if it was just sailing through the ocean but now that they're sailing past British and French colonies they're in quite busy shipping lanes they're seeing um, say British ships as they sail along and they, they know that the word must be spreading and the enemy must know yeah. where they are. <clears throat> so how far is it until Japan by this point in time? I mean, they must be getting close. Not far away. Their next stop is um, in French Indochina, which is today Vietnam. Right. Uh, a place called Cam Ran. Um, and... On the 14th of May, 1905, that's where the two squadrons finally meet. Oh. Uh, the, the third squadron, the old ships, finally catches up. And this was a French um, port, so they weren't particularly welcome. Mm. Um, but what Rosadvetsky does is he stays there for a bit. He leaves only to then immediately come back and kind of almost reset the clock, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, so there's a kind of brief meeting uh, where these two fleets come together um, Nebogatov the, the admiral of the third squadron meets Rosadvensky the only problem is they absolutely despise each other <laughs> uh, they they really hate each other they, they um, are not friends at all, they don't get on and um, as they're at, when they're at Camran, um, a guy we're not mentioned so far, a guy called uh, Admiral uh, Folkazan, who commands um, commanded the ships that were sent through the Suez Canal by Rosvensky. Uh -huh. So he's 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 Rosvensky's second in command. He's a, a big obese uh, admiral. Hmm. And he suffers a stroke. Um, okay. But he, at this point, he, he, he's not dead, but he is kind of incapacitated. And um, Rosadvensky doesn't act. He doesn't kind of remove him from command. He doesn't actually let anybody know because he knows that if uh, 
everybody, if Fulkazam dies, then Nebogatov will be second in command, and he really doesn't like the idea of that. Mm. So um, that is the only time that Rozovetsky and ne- Nebogatov uh, see each other during the entire cruise. Right. One meeting on the 14th of May. And uh, according at least to Nebogatov, Rozovetsky does not share any of his plans for the next steps or for if there is a battle to come, that there will be. Um, none, none, of, none of the plans. So, yeah, we are now very close to Japan in terms of geography, at least scale of the journey we've taken. Close to the enemy. And things are about to get a whole lot worse. It is about to get a whole lot worse, but we will find out about that next week in History's Most Disastrous Voyage Part 2, The Battle of Tsushima. Yeah, we are leaving you on a bit of... um, If you don't want any spoilers, don't look it up online. Uh, Yeah. Because, trust me, it's it's, it's gonna... Well, if this bit was a bit of a tragic comedy, I think the next bit is almost just a tragedy. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Because all the effort that they've gone to here is all gonna be for nothing, and it's gonna be... Yeah. Yeah. We'll not say any more, but this is going to be an absolute catastrophe. <laughs> Indeed. So, if you have any uh, comments or suggestions or anything, uh, feel free to email us again at uh, histories.most at gmail.com. That is without an apostrophe S, um, just histories.most, histories.most at gmail.com. Uh, also visit us on Twitter at History's Most. Yeah, and we would we would love to do maybe like an email section. So, you know, get in touch with what you think. Tell us about a disastrous voyage that mm-hmm. you think we could have opted for instead. Tell us, talk to us as well about our last episode. Have you got a suggestion about who History's Most Guilty Man might be? Um, and we'd love to kind of read out a few suggestions from you guys. Mm, absolutely love it. Well, I have been Peter. And I've been Alex, and we look forward to telling you the end of this fantastic story in the next episode of History's Most. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs>